Iran is facing a new wave of sanctions, with remaining sanctions set to kick in in November. This comes after President Trump withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal in May. Despite this, President Trump said in late July that he'd be open to talks with the country's leader with no preconditions. Earlier, my colleague Rina Nainan sat down with Masi Alinejad. She's an Iranian journalist and activist and author of The Wind in My Hair, My Fight for Freedom in Modern Iran. She spoke about U.S.-Iranian relations, the treatment of women in Iran in her, and her memoir. Before we get to the book, I want to ask you sort of about the situation on the ground in Iran. President Trump has said that he'd like to meet face-to-face -face with Iranian President Rouhani. How do the people in Iran view President Trump? Well, let me tell you first something about President Trump. I just listening to the news in America, and I see, um, you know, there are many experts here. They cannot analyze or predict uh, Donald Trump and what he's going to do next. Mm. So he said that first he has threatened Iran um, with military action, and then he came out and he said he's going to have negotiation. I myself cannot predict what's, what's, what he's going to do next. But what um, the majority of Iranian people want Donald Trump to do is um, first removing Iranian people from travel ban, ban the oppressors, ban the Islamic Republic um, officials and their children, because they are the troublemakers. And we don't want any war. Instead. We want um, you know, him to sanction, not people, sanction the Islamic Republic's state TV, which is the main propaganda tool for the oppressors. Uh, sanction the Revolutionary Guard, who beaten up people in the street. Mm. And we welcome um, any peaceful move from Donald Trump. Right now, the Iranians are rejecting the president's offer to meet face to face. But you look at the economy right now, the currency is tanking, it's taken a nosedive. You look at the protests on the ground. Do you think that the Iranian regime might be open to talks with Donald Trump? Um, you know, we, still, we cannot predict the Islamic Republic of Iran as well. They might sit down and have negotiation with Donald Trump. But what is important for us right now, let me tell you something. When the deal happened, I was supporting, I was just supporting the deal from the beginning. Because Iranian I didn't, nuclear deal? Yes. Mm -hmm. I didn't want Iran to be isolated. I didn't want my people to suffer from sanction. But the benefit of the deal, the benefits, didn't go to people. So that's why actually people took to the street in 80 cities and protested against, uh, you know, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran and asking where is the benefits of the deal. They were asking why the money goes to Syria, why the money goes to Lebanon, why the money goes to Gaza. So they were actually suffering from lack of water. People are suffering from lack of electricity. That is why they're really, I mean, angry right now and taking uh, to the street to protest. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo last month delivered remarks on Iran and supporting Iranian voices. He actually mentioned your campaign by name. I want to play you that bite. Sure. The government's morality police beat women in the streets and arrest those who do not wish to wear the hijab. On White Wednesday, activists recently, one activist was recently sentenced to 20 years in prison for protesting compulsory hijab wearing. How did you feel when the Secretary of State mentioned your campaign? I was invited to be to this event, but I was worried that the Islamic Republic of Iran going to use this and to, you know, oppress the White Wednesday's activists inside Iran. They're really cruel. So, um, Tell us what is White Wednesday? White Wednesday is a, you know, campaign, it's a peaceful campaign in Iran where, you know, people take to the street and protest against um, Islamic uh, compulsory hijab laws. So they're taking off their hijab, walking on rail, showing the civil disobedience, which is a punishable crime. And uh, when Secretary Pompeo mentioned about the White Wednesday's campaign, honestly, my first feeling was, why we don't have any minister inside Iran to mention about that? Why our foreign minister lied about compulsory hijab while he was interviewed in America by American journalists? He said that, you know, hijab is part of Iranian culture, which is not. After the revolution, Islamic Republic of Iran actually, you know, took women's body hostage and forced them to wear compulsory hijab. Mm -hmm. And now when, you know, I launched a campaign a year ago, and I, I want to say, well, you have to understand is we are not fighting against a small piece of cloth. 
we are actually challenging the foundational block of the Islamic Republic of Iran. We are challenging the main pillar of the Islamic Republic of Iran. That is actually why the you know government of Iran are really mad and actually sentenced one of these uh, white women's activists mm -hmm. twenty years prison. It means 18 years suspended and two years in prison. And they want to scare women and stop women uh, from protesting against, you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran. See, I want to switch gears for a second here. Um, you call yourself the product of the Iranian Revolution. Your parents supported it. You did not. Yeah. Because, you know, my parents actually supported the revolution because they were really poor. They were looking for a better opportunity to live. and. That revolution right now became a revolution against women and its own people. And um, none of the promises of the revolution has been delivered so far. So that's why I uh, always say that I myself had to start my own revolution from my own family's kitchen. Because uh, we had female singers before the revolution. Women were allowed to enter stadiums before the revolution. Women were allowed to choose what they wanted to wear. We had judges, you know. Women could participate in specific uh, sports. You weren't required to wear the hijab before 79. Yes, but what happened after the revolution? We lost all the social freedom we already had, and people like my parents, they didn't find a better opportunity to live right now, and they're suffering from economical uh, corruption as well. In your book, you say that the Iranian Revolution was a step backwards for women, and that being born a woman in the Islamic Republic is like having a disability. Why do you say that? Because, you know, this is the way the Islamic Republic of Iran look at like, a woman like you. When they see you, you know, uncovered, unveiled, they attack you, and they see you as a threat. So they uh, consider you as a second-class citizen. Your testimony is half a man. You know, you, the heritage, half a man. Um, you are not even allowed to get a passport to travel abroad without getting permission from your, you know, um, hu husband. So you are not even allowed to get an education without getting permission from your husband. So that's why this is the way, actually, the Islamic Republic of Iran look at uh, the women inside Iran. But I want to say that women Right now, they're breaking the law every day to challenge this, you know, uh, the regime, to show them that we are not disabled and we are not going to be victims. We are the victorious, we are the warriors, and we are pushing back the boundaries every day. I see the movement right here before <laughs> us. Thank you so much, Monsieur, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.